So let's talk about Jimmy Stewart, one of the most iconic and recognizable movie stars of all time. You think you know his legend, right? A career that spanned an amazing six decades. He was that rare combination of critical and commercial success. He was nominated for five Oscars, did you know that? Starred in three of the greatest movies of all time, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, It's a Wonderful Life, and Rear Window, one of my personal favorites. But do you know the details of his greatest role as World War II hero? I'm guessing not. Jimmy wasn't some Hollywood show pony during the war. He was a legitimate bona fide war hero and a badass. And this is his amazing story. So over the past few months, we've done a bunch of short videos on Hollywood stars that saw real action during World War II. Based on your comments and your feedback, you seem to really love these videos, in part because some of their stories just aren't that well known. Guys like Charles Bronson, Eddie Albert of Green Acres fame, Donald Pleasance, Russell Johnson, the professor from Gilligan's Island, like who knew? Even little Audrey Hepburn did her part as part of the Dutch resistance. Now we have more of these shorts coming, fear not, lots more heroes to discuss. But I gotta say, of all these shorts, one has really stood out, and that is the story of Jimmy Stewart. And it's not because people are shocked to learn that he saw combat during World War II. I think most of you, myself included, were kind of vaguely aware that he stepped up and did something important in the war. It wasn't a shock the way it was like with Donald Pleasance or Russell Johnson in those videos. All the comments were, I had no idea, because most of us really had no idea. But I remember growing up and knowing that Jimmy Stewart did something important in the war, but I never really had any detailed understanding of what it was. Just that he was in the war and he did his part. But in doing that short, short video on Jimmy Stewart, I quickly got a much deeper appreciation for his time during the war. I mean, this guy didn't just sign up and show up. His contributions and his heroics were indistinguishable from any other World War II hero. Meaning, you would never have known from his time in the war that he was actually a bona fide movie star, and he was a bona fide movie star. And that's the other part that really stuck out to me about Jimmy. He didn't serve in the war prior to his acting career, or he wasn't some struggling actor when he enlisted. He was already one of Hollywood's most bankable stars. His career literally was just taking off. In fact, he had won the Oscar in 1940 for Philadelphia Story. Fantastic movie, by the way. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And he puts it all on hold. Now, I'm gonna go into more detail on this. And to be sure, there are other big names from Hollywood, guys like Clark Gable, who saw combat during World War II, but nothing on the order of what Jimmy Stewart saw, not even close. That's not to disparage Clark Gable. He saw legitimate combat, and he was a big star, probably bigger than Jimmy. But there was no star the magnitude of Jimmy Stewart who saw as much or as dangerous or as intense combat as he did. Like I said, it wasn't even close. And some guys, like John Wayne, Mr. Tough Guy War Hero on the screen, went out of their way to avoid the war and instead focus on their career. Something Jimmy Stewart wouldn't have considered doing in a million years. So that's really why I wanted to do this longer video. And this is a longer video. Please stick around for the whole thing. The best part, frankly, is at the end. You know, as you know, this channel is all about honoring our heroes. And I have to say that Jimmy Stewart is a, the rarest of breeds. This guy was in the public eye virtually his entire life. And yet this part of his life from 1941 to 1946 somehow is still underappreciated. It's not that it's unknown, it's just underappreciated. I mean, we think we know these movie stars from their on-screen personas, but it's just that, those are personas. To understand Jimmy Stewart, you really need to understand his service during the war. It's just that critical. And with Jimmy Stewart, you have to go back to the beginning. All the values that he carries with him throughout his career and during the war could be traced to his upbringing in small town, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Funny name, Indiana, Pennsylvania, but one of those places that still had that kind of 19th century pioneer feel to it. I mean, you can almost picture it. His dad owns a hardware store on Main Street. He's a pillar of the community, well-respected by everybody. They're a deeply religious family and a family of war heroes, by the way. Both of Jimmy's grandfathers fought in the Civil War and his dad fought in the Spanish-American War. So service literally runs through their veins. And growing up, Jimmy's an introvert. He's a bit of a daydreamer. 
He likes nothing more than just to be left alone and build model airplanes, believe it or not. I find that hilarious. And he's really fascinated with aviation. He would later say that Lindbergh's solo flight across the Atlantic was one of the defining moments of his life. And he really wants to attend one of the military academies, but his dad actually talks him out of it and convinces him to go to Princeton, which he does. Not a bad backup plan. So it's while at Princeton where Jimmy first catches the acting bug, doing theater, and he befriends Henry Fonda of all people, and they would stay best friends for life. One of the things that actually bonds the two of them is their mutual love of building model airplanes, like go figure. So he graduates Princeton, he moves to New York City, he gives Broadway a go, he actually rooms with Henry Fonda, and he has just enough success to realize that acting could be a legitimate career for him. After a few years in New York City, he and Fonda both decide to go west to Hollywood and take a shot at movies. Remember, keep in mind, this is 1935, and the movie industry is just beginning to boom. So he arrives in Hollywood, and again, he finds just enough work to stay gainfully employed. He's got bit parts here and there, but the studios, they really don't know what to do with them. I mean, after all, you know, Jimmy Stewart is not classic leading man handsome the way a Clark Gable or a Cary Grant is. You know, he's thin. He sort of has that halting Midwestern speaking style. It's a little weird. He doesn't exactly exude masculinity. In fact, he has a slightly androgynous look to him, to be honest. He just doesn't scream traditional leading man, at least not to the Hollywood studios. But in 1936, he gets his big break with the movie Next Time We Love, which requires boyish likability more than that kind of rugged masculinity. And it's both a commercial and a critical success. So much so that none other than the New York Times calls him a welcome addition to the roster of Hollywood's leading men. So this is before the era of fake news, so I have to believe that. Now keep in mind, he graduated Princeton just four years prior, so this is a pretty quick rise to Hollywood leading man status, even if he is a slightly quirky, offbeat, non-traditional leading man, which he is. So it's two years later when Jimmy becomes a full-fledged movie star with Frank Capra's You Can't Take It With You, which actually won the Oscar in 1938 and is a fantastic movie. It's both a commercial and a critical success, and Jimmy is really credited with carrying the film. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. He carries that movie. Interestingly, it's Frank Capra who sees in Jimmy Stewart something that most directors and Hollywood studios are missing. This sort of accessible, everyman, Midwestern quality, this earnestness that connects him with audiences. As Capra would later say, men could relate to Jimmy Stewart even if they wanted to be Cary Grant, which I think is a great line. You know, slight tangent here, but he and Cary Grant are the polar opposite when it comes to kind of the Hollywood leading man archetypes, but it works for both of them. Second tangent, there's actually an excellent miniseries on Grant's complicated life called Archie, which is running right now. It is fantastic. If you want to know more about Cary Grant, watch that miniseries. Okay, so that would be the first of several defining collaborations between Capra and Stewart. The next coming the following year with Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, in my estimation, one of the greatest films of all time, and certainly one of Jimmy's most iconic performances. His portrayal of a neurotic idealist thrown into the political arena earns him his first Oscar nomination, and it really solidifies him as one of the most bankable stars in Hollywood. Again, at the age of 30, that's still pretty young. So what does Jimmy Stewart do for an encore? He follows it up with Philadelphia Story in 1940, where he wins his only Oscar, actually beating out his best friend, Henry Fonda of all people. This is absolutely one of my all-time favorite movies. I'm not gonna describe the plot because it's like way too complicated, but suffice to say, he steals the movie from both Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. Not an easy thing to do. It is a fantastic movie, check it out. So in four short years, Jimmy has gone from bit player to quirky leading man, to movie star, and then to bona fide superstar by 1940. And by 1940, he really is a bona fide superstar. There's no doubt about it. He's actually one of the few actors in Hollywood who's both critically acclaimed and box office gold. Something the other leading men of that day, you know, Cary Grant, John Wayne, even his buddy Henry Fonda, they can't pull that off. They're either one or the other. He can do both. And I believe personally, it's that kind of everyman, earnest, Midwestern quality that is the secret to his extraordinary success. So all the while, Jimmy is learning his craft in Hollywood and growing his career. 
He's also becoming a licensed pilot. It's one of the first things he does, in fact, when he moves to Hollywood, he begins taking flying lessons. He quickly becomes an accomplished pilot, and as his career takes off, he actually buys his own plane, a little three-seater called the Stinson 105. And by the way, he's still making model airplanes with his buddy Henry Fonda, which I just love. Clearly, the aviation infatuation is not a passing fancy with Jimmy. So let me step back for a second. There's been some confusion about how he actually enters military service. Was Jimmy drafted or did he enlist? There have been literally hundreds of comments on our short video debating this very point back and forth. And so I want to set the record straight. It's actually complicated. It's both. So let me, let me explain this. It's a little bit weird. So in October 1940, Jimmy Stewart was actually among the first wave of men to receive a draft notice, which had just begun in September of that year. But for whatever reason, when he gets the draft notice and before he's actually inducted into the Army, he enlists. Again, it's not altogether clear. If you have any information on why he did this, certainly leave it in the comments. Again, my theory is that he wanted to be in the Army Air Corps and instead of uh, being drafted into the Army, he wanted to enlist in the Army Air Corps, and, that, and that's what he does. At least that's what I think. But again, if you have any information on this, leave it in the comments. So anyway, when he reports for his physical after enlisting, they actually turn him down because he's underweight. I mean, can you believe that? The guy gets rejected for being too skinny. Now most people, and I'm talking about John Wayne here, would actually breathe a sigh of relief at such news, right? But not Jimmy Stewart. What does he do? He actually appeals the decision. He asks for a second chance at a weigh-in. He starts eating everything in sight, evidently, and he puts on the requisite weight and barely manages to pass the physical in February 1941. And on March 22nd, two-time Oscar-nominated Hollywood Golden Boy, Jimmy Stewart, becomes a private in the United States Army Air Corps. Again, this is before Pearl Harbor. This is in 1941, not 1942. I find that amazing. If you remember nothing else from this video, remember the lengths that Jimmy Stewart went to fight for his country during the war. I just find that incredible. So because Jimmy's a college graduate and a commercial pilot, he applies for a commission as a rated military pilot through a newly initiated service pilot program, and he receives it. He's shipped out to Boise, Idaho for training, and he excels at it, so much so that he's promoted to captain and he's actually made a squadron commander. Really impressive stuff. It's while in Boise though, he gets wind of what the army really wants to do, which is they want to put him in uniform and then put him on a perpetual war bond tour to raise money across the country. And of course, not surprisingly, we've, when he finds out about that, he wants nothing to do with it. It's really the only time that he uses his status, he pulls rank and he goes to the army brass and he insists on getting a combat assignment. I mean, just think about it again. He's a movie star, he's already enlisted, he's earned his military wings, he's been promoted to captain, and now the Army is kind of giving him an easy way out, letting him use his uniform, tour the country, and raise money, and he wants nothing to do with that. He says, no way. He insists on being sent into combat. Look, I don't think the public would have thought any less of Jimmy Stewart if he had just, you know, enlisted, put on the uniform, and did the war bond tour. But Stewart is absolutely determined to be an actual comet. Incredible stuff. And the other thing to keep in mind, what makes this even more incredible, is that the single most dangerous job during the war was being part of a heavy bomber group. The 8th Air Force alone, which Jimmy was a part of, lost 50,000 men during the war. To put that into context, that's more than the entire Marine Corps. Think about it. More than the entire Marine Corps, they fought some of the bloodiest battles of World War II, Tarawa, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, Saipan, Okinawa, and the 8th Air Force actually had more deaths. Again, heavy bombers doing daylight bombing runs had a 20% mortality rate, meaning you were statistically dead after five runs. And they also had a requirement of doing 30 missions, so you were statistically dead multiple times to get to 30 missions. I mean, that is incredible. There are a lot of great videos on how dangerous it was being part of a heavy bomber crew. I'll leave a few links in the description box. Definitely check it out, it's worth it. You know, in fact, Apple Plus, they're launching a series in January called Masters of the Air, which is all about the 8th Air Force. And I hope they focus a little bit on Jimmy Stewart. They should, such an incredible story. Point is, this was the most dangerous, hazardous job in all of World War II, and that is saying a lot. And Jimmy Stewart insisted on being in the middle of the action. That is just incredible. 
So Jimmy Stewart is assigned to the 445th Heavy Bomb Group and they're shipped off to England in late 1943. So on December 13, 1943, he flies his first combat mission as the pilot of a B-24, leading the high group squadron in a strike of the U-boat pens at Kiel, which as many of you know, that is a critical target. So he's thrown right into the deep end. A few days later, he's the lead pilot for the 445th in their bombing run on Bremen, as you know, another critical target. And then on Christmas Eve of all days, he again leads the group on a mission against the German rocket launching sites at Paddy Calais, which by the way, as many of you know, with over 2,000 bombers in the air, that mission happened to be the 8th Air Force's largest mission to date. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility in a short period of time. Jimmy Stewart is thrown right into the deep end. Some really important missions here. These are no, you know, show pony milk runs or publicity stunts. He's in the thick of it, leading the group at the most critical juncture of the air war, by the way. I mean, this is just off the charts bravery and badassery in my book. I can't imagine anyone today doing this, or frankly, anyone back then doing that. Like I said, Clark Gable flew a lot of missions, I think like five or 10 as a gunner, but it was nothing like this. I mean, this was really, really intense stuff. So at this point, Jimmy Stewart is more than just a competent, competent bomber pilot. He's actually a leader. He has enormous responsibility, and by all accounts, he's excelling at it. You know, he's earned the respect and the admiration of everyone, and he absolutely refuses to talk to the media about it, much to the Army's chagrin. They want him to talk and promote it and all that stuff and be a hero, and he's like, no way, absolutely. He'll have none of it. But I gotta say, it's an incident on January 7, 1944, that says everything you need to know about Jimmy Stewart the man. If you remember nothing else from this video, remember this incident. So let me set it up. They're coming back from a bombing run. They hit the oil refineries and the chemical plants at Ludwighaven in Germany. When Jimmy Stewart notices that the group that he's following, the 389th, they're actually 30 degrees off course on the, on the return route. So he informs the group's leader and they insist they're on the correct heading. Now Jimmy knows that it's wrong. He also knows that if the 389th gets separated from the protection of the larger formation, they're gonna be sitting ducks for German fighters. So even though he knows it's wrong and that they're gonna go into this kind of intense German firefight, he has his group, which he's leading by the way, stick with the 389th on the wrong course just to give them protection. I mean, the guy literally volunteers to fly into an ambush. And that's exactly what happens. They're met by 60 German fighters. Now Stewart, he has the group close up the formation to protect the 389th. And while Jimmy's group didn't lose any planes, the 389th suffered huge casualties, including the lead plane, by the way, that made the bad call. But were it not for J Jimmy's gutsy call and staying with the 389th, they would have been completely annihilated. Shortly after that, he's promoted to major. I mean, that is incredible. I mean, this guy, the guts it took to stick with them knowing they had a wrong call is amazing. Again, if you remember nothing else, remember that. You know, really, throughout the early part of 1944, these missions, they only intensify. There's more of them, they're more dangerous, they have even higher casualties. The 445th, his group, was particularly hit hard. Jimmy saw a lot of his men get killed, and I mean a lot. Hundreds of men under his command die, and it's not because of anything he did, it's just intense and hazardous. This is dangerous stuff. Again, there are a lot of great videos on the 8th Air Force and the hazards of daylight bombing runs. You should really check them out, it's pretty gruesome. I mean, they were gruesome and awful runs. A lot of carnage. We've done a few long videos on bombers ourselves. One with a bombardier named Nick Swatek, who happens to be a friend of mine now. He's 100 years old. Check out that video. I'll leave a link in the description box. But it'll give you an understanding at just how scary and dangerous these daylight bombing runs really were. So it's at this point, after about 15 or so missions, that Stewart is transferred to the 453rd Bombardment Group and he takes on more of a group operations officer role, which means that he's responsible really for all the details and planning for the group's missions and the like, a really, really important job. So why the transfer and shift in duties? You know, it's not altogether clear. Part of it may have been that, you know, Jimmy had become what they call a little flak happy, which is a polite way of saying that, you know, he had shell shock or some form of PTSD, which by the way, was not uncommon for bomber pilots. If you've ever seen the movie 12 O'Clock High, you know what I'm talking about. These bomber pilots, they suffered a lot up there watching the other planes go down, watching crew members die. 
I mean, part of it may have been that the army just understood Jimmy had done his part and he was more valuable alive than dead and they didn't want him to die. It's hard to say, but he never requested it. But it probably was the right call. And again, it was not that unusual to get reassigned. He was a very good leader and they wanted to take advantage of his leadership skills, I'm sure. And this wasn't some lame desk job, by the way. These operation roles were critical. And he still flew about five more missions, at least that we know of, maybe more. So he wasn't totally grounded. So in February of 1945, Jimmy's actually promoted a full colonel as he became the second bombardment wing's chief of staff under Milton Arnold, an enormously important role. I mean, this is a big time role. This is real leadership. This is in Hollywood status. This is the real deal. So in four years, for those of you keeping track at home, Jimmy goes from a buck private to a full colonel, something few people have ever done. And it's not because he's a Hollywood star. He did it all on his merits. No special treatment here. I mean, it's just mind numbing how good he really was during the war. We have no idea. And keep in mind, he hadn't been training for this his whole life. He wasn't a career military guy. He was an actor. He was a very good actor. And keep in mind, he wasn't young. By pilot standards, he's an old man. I mean, this is hard to, it's hard to describe how impressive this really is. It's just amazing, amazing stuff. So Jimmy Stewart returns to the States in 1945, and he goes into the Army Air Force Reserve, and later the Air Force Reserve when it becomes its own branch in 1947. And it wouldn't be the end of his service, by the way. In 1959, he's actually promoted to Brigadier General in the Air Force Reserve, making him the highest ranking actor in military history, which I find very cool. And he's also not done with flying, by the way. He's actually called up for active duty in 1966 for two weeks. Most people don't know this. And he's sent on an inspection tour of Vietnam. And while there, he insists on participating in a 12-hour bombing strike against the VC as an observer aboard a, 50, a B-52. Which, by the way, this plane almost crashed. It narrowly averted a catastrophic landing thanks to the quick thinking of Captain Bob Amos. And in typical J Jimmy Stewart fashion, he never once spoke about this mission ever. Again, the guy was still flying in 1966. So World War II is over for Jimmy Stewart, but it never really leaves him. You know, he kind of enters it a fresh face, boyishly handsome 32 year old man, and he comes back a kind of gaunt, rail thin, markedly older looking man. I mean, he's really in Hollywood, he's almost unrecognizable. And like many returning men, you could literally see the horrors of war etched into the deep grooves on his face. I mean, for someone whose face is their career, there's no reversing the toll that the war has taken on him physically. And by the way, it's also taken a toll mentally big time. You know, today we call it PTSD, but that, back then they simply called it being shell-shocked. But whatever it was, Jimmy Stewart suffered from it and suffered big time. He saw unfathomable horrors up close, and it affected him very deeply for the remainder of his life. Again, like many returning GIs, he'd suffer from chronic insomnia, bouts of depression, anxiety, nightmares, even a little bit of survivor's guilt. But he would never think about talking about it. None of them ever did. They simply suffered in silence, which is so sad. So Jimmy Stewart kept it to himself. But unlike most GIs who went back to anonymity, you could see the changes in Jimmy Stewart physically and mentally through his work on the big screen. Believe it or not, when he gets back, work is scarce for him. Hollywood, the vicious place that it was and is, waits for absolutely nobody, not even war heroes. And in his absence, younger stars, guys like Montgomery Clift, Gregory Peck, Van Johnson and others, they take the roles that should have gone to Jimmy. And no studio wanted to take a chance on Jimmy, really. He looked much older than his 37 years, that kind of boyish charm is now replaced by hardened sadness. And he'd been out of the public eyes for five years, which in Hollywood terms is a long time. He's actually seriously contemplating leaving Hollywood. Again, he won the Oscar in 1940. He contemplates leaving Hollywood to go back to Pennsylvania and take over his dad's hardware store when his old friend Frank Capra throws him a lifeline. And by the way, Capra was also in World War II and saw real combat. And he throws him a lifeline in the form of, it's a wonderful life. Now you all know the movie, I'm not gonna go into it, but playing George Bailey is the signature performance of his career. And I think in part because we're watching real time, his PTSD play out on the screen, I mean, we really see it. You know, when George Bailey melts down over money and family troubles, it's not George Bailey running into the dark night, eyes wide, 
arms waving in this kind of manic free fall. That's actually Jimmy Stewart. And it's not George Bailey crying at that bar, begging God for guidance. That's Jimmy Stewart crying. In fact, that scene, one of the most iconic in cinematic history, that wasn't even a close-up. But Capra realized Jimmy was having an authentic breakdown, tears and all, and he kept the cameras rolling to capture the moment. You know, afterwards, Capra told Jimmy he wanted to reshoot it as a close-up and get a tighter look. And Jimmy said, no way, he can never do that again. So this Christmas, when you watch It's a Wonderful Life for like the umpteenth time, watch him relive the war on his face in that scene. You can see it. You'll also see it when he unloads on poor Donna Reed and their kids in that famous meltdown scene at his home. You know, in fact, after they shot that scene, he actually apologized to Donna and the kids for the realism. He said, literally, I don't know what came over me. You know, Donna Reed would say of making that movie, it was not a pleasant experience. And I can only imagine it was not a pleasant experience. But It's a Wonderful Life saved and revised his career. It may have saved his life, frankly. You know, he'd go on after the war to do some of his best work, including four masterpieces with Alfred Hitchcock, who managed to tap into Stewart's now kind of unsettled darkness and neurosis for some of his best performances. So we covered a lot of ground here. I hope you have a deeper appreciation of Jimmy Stewart. I know I do. It's worth going back and watching some of his pre-war and his post-war movies to actually see the physical, emotional changes in the man. Jimmy Stewart was one of a kind. We'll never see the likes of a Hollywood hero like him again. Till next time, I'm Nick Ragone.